recording. Cool. I turned it on, folks. We <laughs> have recording going on. That's awesome. Excellent. 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 So we're just counting down now. It's like it's like New Year's Eve, seven, no. six, five. <laughs> You know, and I'll bet New Year's Eve's going to look different this year, too. I will bet you it will. I guess well, you're, I guess welcome. You're right. Welcome, everyone. I know we've still got people joining us, but I'm not going to delay getting started. I want to welcome you to our October, our first October, delayed September, <laughs> Insurance Trends webinar. Uh, I am Pam Reese. I am Vice President of Continuing Education and Certification Training at AD Banker & Company. And my co-host, Linda McHenry, uh, is a she is a course developer. She's my favorite course developer, <laughs> a writer, trainer, subject matter expert, fiction writer, uh, lover of dogs, and <laughs> and, uh, and all things uh, Cape Cod, I think. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. Yeah. And didn't you go to Cape Cod recently? Twice. We had a week's vacation. Um, we were good that we only wound for a couple of days because my brother had to be hospitalized, but we did go for three or four days in September and it was uh, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, that's one place that I've added to my list that I'm going to go. And I want to reiterate to everyone that we do have professional development credit available. It's not insurance CE or CFP CE, but professional development. For those of you who like to put that in your employment file, or if your employer requires you to have so many hours of professional development, additional training during the year, uh, I know that SILA members can use this uh, certificate to get insurance or to get to designation uh, credit, and that's awesome. My email is at the bottom of the slide, pamr at adbanker.com, and you can email me directly and just request that certification after the training is over, and I will email it to you. Um, as well as if you were forwarded an invitation, you can go to our website and opt in, and we can get you added to the mailing list. Oh, the puppies. Today's topics, Linda, tell us what we're going to be talking about. We're gonna talk about pet insurance uh, first, then we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence, which of course is the basics of the internet of things. And as we move along, I know there were some of you who asked questions in your registration form, and I believe most of those questions are gonna be answered in the presentation, but if they're not, feel free to just type your questions in your chat box, and we'll do our best to get you answers and anything we can't answer here on the webinar live. I'll take note of and and we'll um we'll email you um afterwards. So speaking about pets right now, I hear Mr. Murphy approaching. <laughs> Mr. So Murphy he, is he put in here. here he is. Here he is. This wasn't planned. <laughs> Pet insurance, Mr. Murphy. Do you need He's 17 Mr. years old and he does what he wants to do. So he has no respect for webinars. So I apologize, everybody. So we're gonna get into pet insurance. And it's one of those things where pet insurance is really a form of health insurance. And a lot of people think it's PNC insurance and depending upon the state, um, they, they, they might regulate it the same way. And I know, didn't you say, Pam, that yeah. you just saw something recently where one of the states wants to um, declare it, uh, regulate it as inland marine? So it right. doesn't I think that's be... Texas. Yeah, that's Texas, Texas has got a bill proposed. And I know the NAIC, I talked about that earlier with the um, AI, but the NAIC has also got a pet insurance working group. Yeah, and that, I was it looking at that earlier. Limited line. Yeah, I was looking at that earlier, and different states are handling it differently. But the, the thing to understand about pet insurance is why it's become so popular. So I'm sharing some statistics with you on the slide. Um, According to the American Pet Products Association, that's where that information is from, more than two thirds of US households own a pet. Um, so in addition to the numbers on your screen, four and a half million households own a reptile, which I don't get, and 1.6 million households own a horse and 1.6 million households own saltwater fish. So the fact that so many people have pets and so many people are concerned about them, um, the cost of pet medical care uh, is has been increasing steadily since they first started keeping statistics in 2001. And when you see the other services on your screen, um, they consist of boarding, grooming, insurance, training, 
you know, pet training, the little clicker training things, all the different courses, obedience training, pet sitting, pet walking, basically everything other than vet care. So here in the US, people spend a tremendous amount um, of money on their pets. And, and when it comes to health insurance, um, we have health insurance and basically that's what pet insurance is. And there's all different kinds, but when you read the policies, which I've done, they read just like health insurance policies. Most insurers will only insure dogs and cats. I mean, there are some that will do others. Now, um, is there are, there's equine insurance. You can get that, you know, which is a specialty form of coverage. And of course, livestock and, and, and animals that are used commercially can be insured in Inland Marine. But when it comes to pets that are owned by, by individuals, um, the health insurance offers different types and levels of coverage. There's sublimits involved, there's deductibles, there's exclusions. Um, depending upon the insurer, different plans can be offered and the client chooses from the plans. Some companies just have a one size fits all plan and you know, either you're, you take it or you leave it. Now, one of the things to think about with the rating of pets and the pet insurance is it's similar to the way we would rate humans. It's based on life expectancy. And the average, this is information that I found interesting, but when you think about health insurance, it makes sense. You know, you, you hear the, the, the adage, oh, for, for every year of your cat's or dog's life, multiply it by seven. Well, that's not really true. Actually, by the time a dog or a cat is one year old, that's the equivalent of age 15 wow. in human. And like, for example, a cat, by the time they're age five, they're 35 in human years. By the time they're 10, they're 56. By the time they're 20, they're 96. So Murph is 84. Okay, he's 17 in cat years. Using that, he's 84. I'm going to really have to give him a treat letter for coming on scene and, and, and being so <laughs> timely. Now, for dogs, though, it's different. What you do is you take the average human life expectancy of 79 years, and you divide that by the average lifespan for the breed. And this is really important to remember with pet insurance. The coverages and the rates are based on the breed because the breeds have different life expectancies. So a five-year-old dog with a 12-year-old life expectancy, you take the human life expectancy of 79 divided by 12, and you get 6.6. .6. So that means the dog is about 33 in human years. So again, when you're looking at the rates, some people get upset because they see, oh, wow, you know, I have this big dog and it, it costs more money. I mean, I have a, a big dog that costs more money than that dog or a little dog is, is less expensive. And, you know, again, it's based on the breed, not the size. So when we're looking at the health insurance, um, you want to um, look at what treatments are covered, what the exclusions are. Some of them will include actually end of life costs, so they'll pay for burials and cremations. Um, you'll find some policies will add coverage to an auto policy, all right? If, if, if pets are injured in an auto accident, you know, you have your, 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 your dog or your cat in the car. So again, each one of the policies is different. And let me just give you an example on this next slide. You have your basic coverage, which is the least expensive. So that would be the lower levels or tiers of coverage. And if, if reimbursement is paid on a percentage, it's gonna be obviously a lower percentage. So it might pay at 50% instead of 80. It's gonna cover things like accidents, poisoning, certain kinds of illness, including cancer. There will be an annual deductible. There'll be a cap per accident or illness, and there'll be a cap on the total amount paid in the policy term. Now, if you go to a comprehensive policy, obviously it's gonna be more expensive. It will have higher reimbursement rates, and it will cover additional things. It'll cover, um, in addition to accidents, it'll cover emergencies, illnesses, maybe office visits. Uh, they might pay for prescriptions or diagnostic tests, x-rays, labs. You know, again, each carrier is gonna be different. Um, the deductibles on a comprehensive plan will be lower than you see on basic, but you're still gonna see deductibles. And again, you'll still see the caps, but again, they'll probably be lower. Now, one of the things that most health plans don't include, but that you can purchase separately is well care or preventative coverage. And that's reimbursement for your vet exams, your flea and heartworm prevention and your shots. And there wouldn't be a deductible to that, but that's kind of that's expensive. Now, as you see with other forms of health insurance, there are certain conditions that are usually covered, certain that are excluded. So again, your accidents, your illnesses, your surgery, and, and the related expenses are typically 
um, covered. You might see a waiting period. So if you buy the coverage, you may not be able to have coverage for the first three or six months. Pam, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah, so when we talk about pet insurance being very similar to and, and looking like and functioning like health insurance, it is not Affordable Care Act coverage. So no, so no. pre-existing conditions can apply. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this All is, right. when I say it's like health insurance, it's it's modeled after the health insurance we use. You know, but then again, too, you look at disability insurance and long-term care, that's modeled after health insurance and the ACA doesn't apply. But that is a good point. Um, there absolutely are pre-existing conditions. And some of them, um, most of them are hereditary. So if a certain breed of dog, has a predisposition to hip dysplasia or to cancer, you're going to find that for that breed, it would be a pre-existing condition where for another breed, you may not see it. All right. Okay. So again, um, there, again, there might be a waiting period. Some of the health plans actually have provider networks the way we see in health insurance. You know, so certain vets belong to certain plans, you know, the way dentists and doctors do. So that's something that you're going to want to caution your clients to. Um, usually preventive care, dental care isn't covered. Any kind of behavioral problem, even if it results in an accident, would be excluded. Um, elective procedures, you know, again, similar to the way it works with humans. Um, some plans will actually, before the coverage goes into effect, they'll require the, the animal to be examined by a vet and get like a, a certificate that says, yeah, this pet is insurable. Um, so there's again, different requirements. Some of the plans provide broader coverage than others. Now, Linda, do you do you see or, or I have read that health insurance for pets is actually a benefit, like in a cafeteria plan um, that employees can choose. Some some employers are actually offering this as a benefit as part of the. I've employer. heard of that. I've heard of that. Just like you see, some homeowner policies will add an endorsement you know the auto policies will add an endorsement so yeah you're seeing mm -hmm. it in a lot of different places employers are doing it because so many people have pets some employers actually have doggy daycares just like they do people daycare <laughs> you know if people want to bring their pets so on your screen are some of the things that you are going to want your customers to ask when they're buying coverage and if you're selling coverage or if you're considering offering it these are some of the questions that you're going to want to ask you know, is, is the insured able to choose any vet or do they have to choose from the network provider vets? Um, it, what is the deductible in copay? Because there will be deductibles in copayments. Um, you want to know if wellness exams are included. What are any dollar limits for perhaps office fees? Um, are prescriptions covered? And if so, are there copayments? Are there any benefits that renew? Is there a waiting period before coverage starts? And sometimes you'll see them and sometimes you won't. Um, sometimes the pets will have to have an exam before they can be covered. Uh, again, you wanna look at what are the pre-existing conditions. Uh, you wanna see how long the company takes to pay claims. You know, I mean, you're buying, just like as with any other form of coverage, you're paying a relatively small premium to get a big benefit if something happens. So you wanna, check the customer service level and, and see how they pay claims. And again, some people care about um, whether they'll pay for advertising costs if you lose your pet and you wanna you know, print up posters. Um, some people wanna have end of life benefits so they can pay for burial and cremation. So there's you know, different, different considerations when it comes to pet insurance. So another thing to keep in mind, oh, let's say question. In pricing the policy, how do you control for pet owners consenting to expensive treatments that they would not have considered paying for themselves? Well, you know, it's it's really difficult to 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 to, to figure that out because even when it comes to regular insurance, oh, excuse me, that's Murphy messing with my microphone. <laughs> um, even when it comes to regular insurance, there are people who, if they didn't have health insurance, wouldn't have a procedure, but now that they have health insurance, they do. So I think as long as it's covered, you're all set. Um, but again, the broader the coverage, the more expensive the price of the plan. And there are going to be limits as to how much the carrier is going to pay for. So one vet may charge this price for, I don't know, a neuter or a spay, and the plan is only going to pay for so much. You know, So you see that with a lot of a different things. So hopefully that answered your question, Glenn. Yeah, good question. 
You know, there, there are also discount plans that offer vet services. So the vet, if you go to this particular vet, you can get a discount. Um, that's not exactly the same thing as pet insurance, but a lot of people think it is, you know, just like, again, the discount health services we see for us, just because the vet or the doctor participates in a discount plan doesn't, doesn't make that insurance. Um, some vets will also offer their own insurance plans. So the, the veterinary practice itself will offer a form of coverage for wellness plans. So, you know, if you pay so much a year, um, you know, if you if you need to come in for for wellness visits and for you know regular uh, treatment, heartworm, flea and tick, that kind of stuff. You know, they'll they'll they act as their own insurer. Uh, pharmacies will offer discounts for pet prescriptions. My pharmacy does. I get a discount, and there's a lot of discount programs out there. So you might want to check with your pharmacy if you have pets who have to be on regular medication. Uh, you can get discounted rates quite often with that. Um, so again, just some of the things about that. And I, we just want to finish up. I know we're talking about pet insurance, but when it comes to your homeowner's insurance and your pets, I just want to report some statistics. Um, as you can see on your screen, there's an awful lot of dog bites that are reported through hospitals and, and, and doctors. And each state has its own kind of law with respect to dog bite liability. So I just want to explain what they are and you might want to look in your state to see what's going to apply. So when someone has a pet, when someone owns a pet, they're legally responsible for, for their pet and any harm or injuries caused by the pet. So if a state has a dog bite statute, it means the dog bite, excuse me, the dog owner is automatically liable for any injury or property damage the dog causes without provocation. So you have uh, an enthusiastic golden retriever who jumps on someone and they fall and break a leg. The pet owner is going to be responsible for that. Yes, my uh, my sister's the... Labrador got out. The twins uh, got out and they ate the siding off of the corner of the neighbor's house. <laughs> it was... There you go. And that's right. They're responsible for it. Now, if there's a one bite rule, the dog owner is accountable for an injury caused by a dog if the owner had knowledge the dog was likely to cause injury of that nature. So in the instance of Pam's <laughs> twin labs, you know they like to chew on houses. So if they went out and they started chewing up the neighborhood, okay, there would be a problem. So in, in a situation such as this, a victim has to prove that the owner knew that the dog posed a risk to either bite or cause injury. Uh, in a state where there's strict liability rule, um, it, it, it replaces the one bite rule. So the owner would be held liable for damages unless the owner can prove that someone was trespassing on their property or they deliberately provoked the dog. So military and police dog handlers are generally exempt from the dog liability claims or lawsuits if they're on active duty. But otherwise, you know, you've got to be concerned about that. And then finally, there are some states that just have negligence laws. So the dog owner is only going to be deemed liable if um, the claimant or the, the plaintiff can prove that the owner was um, unreasonably careless or negligent when controlling the dog. Now, I have a list here, okay? Uh, I was reading an article yesterday, it just happened to cross my desk, that, that right now, as of like last month in our current environment, these are the top 10 or 11 breeds that insurance companies are most likely to have problems with from an underwriting perspective. And I'm reading them in order. Okay, so it's the top six, one, two, three, four, five, the top seven are pit bulls and Staffordshire Terriers, and actually they're tied for number one. Then we have Doberman Pinscher, Chow Chow, Rottweiler, Presa Canario, and German Shepherds. So most insurance companies don't want to insure those dogs. And then to a lesser degree, but, but quite common, um, the breeds Great Dane, Akita, Ala Alaskan Malamute, Siberian Husky, and Wolf Hybrids tend to be on insurance companies' um, breed um, restriction lists. And you're talking about on the homeowners and the liability. Yeah. You're not talking, those dogs would be able to get pet insurance right but we're talking on the homeowner's liability right. and linda do we have an announcement to make uh are we not working on a course right now <laughs> in the next few weeks linda is going to be starting on a course 
uh, that will be for continuing education on pet insurance. And I, I believe that there's probably a good component or a good uh, argument that this liability issue on the homeowner should be probably included in that. But uh, we're excited. We've also, we can announce it at the end because it's time. Do it now if you want. Okay. Because it's coming up with the artificial <laughs> intelligence. Yeah, you just completed a couple other new continuing education courses, one on drones and then one on cannabis. Right. And I, in fact, um, Pam and I, I wrote them, but we, we did it together, basically. I mean, we planned everything together. I just did the actual typing. Um, the uh, drone risks and coverages is going to debut on October 20th, and ensuring cannabis risks is going to debut on October 23rd. So they're two hour webinars. And they were actually the brainchild of this webinar, the Insurance Trends webinar, because when we were getting requests from people about different subjects, a year, a year and a half ago, those were two of the first requests. Mm -hmm. So they, we want to thank you for asking questions and making suggestions because we really do listen to them. We really do want to know do. what you're interested with. Yes, yes. So, um, so now we're going to move on. Oh, let me just say one more thing about that. And the reason I brought the, the the dog liability, the dog bite statute up, is because that is separate. Okay, your pet insurance is health insurance. All the breeds can get coverage but each carrier is going to restrict the coverage based on the health considerations of the breed, not whether they might bite, uh, not, not, not regardless of whether they're a pedigree, not, it, it's not going to matter whether they're the right color or not. You know how in certain AKC breeds, if you have certain colors, it's not good, or if they have long hair, any of those other things are separate, just like the dog bite and whether they're eligible for homeowner liability coverage. Keep in mind that again, the pet insurance is health insurance. I think that's an important point because I think a lot of people misunderstand that and think that pet insurance is maybe going to cover, you know, veterinary visits, but also liability for dog bites. And yeah, no, separate. that's not it. All right, now, now we're going to talk about artificial intelligence um, and then we're going to move into the Internet of Things and they're both very much intertwined. Um, so, all right, so somebody just asked a copy of the presentation. If you go to the material section of the control panel, a copy of this whole PowerPoint slide presentation for the whole hour is available in PDF form. So Deborah, you should be able to get it for everything. And right, we are so, recording. <laughs> and we are recording as well, right? So if you go to the to the AD Banker website, you'll be able to see that in the Insurance Trends blog. So basically, and pardon me for referring to my notes, okay? But I wanna make sure, because there's a couple of new things in here. And I mean, I talk about artificial intelligence and teach it a lot in a lot of the webinars, but there's some new information that Pam and I was able, were able to dig up this month, because of course this stuff keeps changing. So artificial, the in, artificial intelligence, the definition of it, is the ability of any type of computer or electronic technology to perform functions normally performed by humans. All right, so if a, hum if a machine imitates the way the human brain works, such as by solving problems, reasoning, or learning, it displays artificial intelligence. More and more AI, which is of course the acronym for artificial intelligence, is the tool that's expanding the breadth and scope of what we can do technologically. So the goal of artificial intelligence is to make computers and machines work and respond the same way a human would. And it drives autonomous vehicles, you know, the self-driving cars, speech recognition, such as in your Siri and your Alexa, um, and, and your, your spam inboxes, and a whole bunch of other stuff we're going to get into. So remember, the basic concept of artificial intelligence is to duplicate the way the human mind carries out tasks, makes decisions, reasons, um, perceives things. Right? That's the whole purpose of it. Now, one of the things that if, if you want a resource, if you go to IBM, IBM.com has all kinds of information about artificial intelligence and blockchain, which are two huge, huge elements of where technology is going. Um, so again, that's just a resource for you if you want to look that up. If you Googled IBM and artificial intelligence or IBM and blockchain, you're going to come up with a bunch of resources. Now, one form of artificial intelligence is machine learning. And it's a subcategory of artificial intelligence. And it's technology that enables machines to learn over time. And it utilizes algorithms and mathematical models to mimic neural networks in the human brain. 
So it lets computers acquire knowledge by extracting patterns from raw data rather than following specific instructions. So here's what a neural network is. And again, I'm looking at my notes because it's, I can, I can read to you the complicated stuff, but I want to make sure that I put it in terminology that we don't have to use acronyms with. So a neural network um, is, is the way your brain moves from task to task. You know, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna add, uh, how, what does your brain do? If you are going to write, or if you want to use a computer, how does your mind work? So what, what, what machine learning does is the humans input into the machine the rules and the procedures and the patterns um, of the calculations that have to be done and the problem solving processes so that you can get outcomes from the machine the same way the human brain would. So it, it basically has to slow down the way we think and it has to, excuse me, slows down the way we think so that it can be put into the machine so the machine can handle it. So we have um, three different layers or tiers um, in a neural network. We have the input level, that's where you put information into the machine. And then there's a hidden level where a process goes on. So like when you have a calculator, if you press the button, the machine inside does what it needs to do to get it ready, and then you input more information, and then based on the button you hit, a different process is carried out. So it takes that and it does it behind the scenes so you don't see it, you know, as your computer computes and it calculates and does its thing. And then it spits out a result, and that's your output layer. And when we have machine learning, it's gonna output a bunch of different options, and then it's gonna, it's gonna, prioritize them in the order of what the machine thinks is most likely to occur. So that's that's your machine learning. And there's only one hidden level. So there's only one thing that's going on in the background in machine learning. And when we do machine learning, the artificial intelligence that runs it needs to be monitored by a human being, has to supervise that the machine is working right and has to update how information is put in and what type of information is put in so that, you know, when you look at the outcomes, if the outcomes are accurate, that's great. But if they're not, the human has to determine how to monitor and change and modify what goes in and out. Now, deep learning is just another layer of machine learning. And in, in deep learning, we have multiple hidden layers. It gets much more sophisticated, much more detailed. Um, and Pam mentioned before different kinds of data. You know, your labeled data and your unlabeled or your structured and your unstructured. Um, labeled data is like a name or an address. All right. So when the information's put in, everybody knows what the subject of the data is. But unlabeled data could be a sentence. You know, if somebody repeated a sentence and you're trying to figure out what it means, all the words from the sentence would be put in, and that's your unlabeled data. So now the machine is gonna to have to figure out on its own based on all the other data that's in there and based on all the different calculations and processes and steps that are in the various hidden layers. So I'm probably <laughs> way more complicated than you want. But again, think about your mind and think about how you think things. If you teach a kid with everybody now teaching their kids from home, you know, with school, you're teaching a, a child how to how to add or how to multiply. I think we just know we, we we memorize the answers and we know what they are, so we know that seven times three is twenty one. But having to explain the steps and the processes to the child, that's actually what the machine learning and the deep learning are doing. All right. And so when a machine does it and a machine decides what needs to be taken care of. So on this next slide are examples of artificial intelligence at work. All right. And once again, I'm going to read to you because this art, this information from IBM is, is much more succinct than I can be. So speech recognition is artificial intelligence technology that recognizes spoken words and converts them to digitized text. Speech recognition is the capability that drives computer dictation software. TV remotes, voice-enabled text messaging, and GPS. It also drives voice-driven phone answering machines. Natural language processing, NLP, 
enables a software application, computer, or machine to understand, interpret, and generate human text. We actually see this. I have a book on LL, NLP um, on, from a human, human perspective, how humans do it. So the neuro-linguistic programming, it's called, but it's very similar. And it's behind your digital assistants, all right, your Siri, your Alexa, your chatbots, and other text-based virtual assistants, because it uses sentiment analysis to detect the mood, attitude, and other subjective qualities in language. So it's not just the word. They're listening for the tone. They're listening for the volume. And what, I, what I'd like to in interject is as we go through these, think of how is this going to apply to insurance? And we've seen the, not the, the NLP being applied in the chatbots that are being used to enhance the customer service and customer interactivity experience at the insurance industry level. That is one of the things that the working group you know, looks at is what can the nat what can the artificial intelligence say? Her, his name is Jim. What can he answer and what can he not answer? You know, it's all going to be based on what because this artificial intelligence is not a licensed producer. Well, the other thing is somebody is calling for service and they're very loud and they're talking very quickly and they're agitated the machine could pick this up and they might norm they might bypass some of the normal steps when routing that call and send it directly to a live person yes you know so so these are the kinds of things that this artificial intelligence will do um image recognition and it's also referred to as computer vision or machine vision it's artificial intelligence that can identify and classify objects people writing and even actions within still or moving images. It, it, it drives your fingerprint ID, um, mobile check deposit apps, um, you know, your, your image uh, recognition, your facial image, medical um, image analysis, all that right. kind of stuff. We're using it everywhere. Telemedicine, they're using it. They're also using it in claims and underwriting. to Self-driving cars. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. And, uh, you know, taking claims process from you know, what could have been a week down to a f uh, 10 minutes. Right. Based on what it sees, um, you know, and it, not that humans are, are, ex are excluded from the process, but that this can help focus the human's attention and get the customer's experience enhanced because they're getting paid faster. Right, right. And th there's certain processes that can be expedited. And mm -hmm. when you get to the human element, the people have more time and ability to handle things um, in a way that needs to be done. Yes. Now, <clears throat> retail and entertainment websites use neural networks to recommend additional purchases or media likely to appeal to a customer. Have you ever been on a website and you looked at something and then the next day or an hour later, you see an ad for it? Okay, that's what artificial intelligence is doing. Research has found that online recommendations can increase sales anywhere from five to 30%. So again, that's driving that. And I think that would apply to any business. Uh, virus and spam protection uses artificial intelligence. Okay, used to be okay. driven by rule-based expert systems. Now the virus, antivirus software employs deep neural networks that can learn to detect new types of spam as quickly as cyber criminals come up with it. Automated stock trading designed to um, optimize a stock portfolio. Um, it makes thousands and millions of trades per day without human intervention. Rideshare services, your Uber, is driven by artificial intelligence, Uber, Lyft, mm -hmm. and other rideshare services match up passengers with drivers to minimize wait times, to alleviate the expenses of the, of the company providing the services, and to eliminate that need for demand surge, you know, the high cost and expenses of rides. Household ro robots, Pam's favorite thing. <laughs> the, ro the, the robot Roomba vacuum uses artificial intelligence to determine the size of a room, identify and avoid obstacles, and learn the most efficient route for vacuuming a floor. Do you mm -hmm. see that with lawn mowers, pool cleaners, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then the, the last thing I want to mention is the autopilot technology. Um, it's been flying commercial and military aircraft for decades. Today, autopilot uses a combination of sensors, GPS, um, image recognition, collision avoidance, robotics, and natural language processing to guide an aircraft safely through the skies, and then to update pilots as, as needed. So again, depending upon who you ask today, um, you know, 
I think there's so many ways artificial intelligence is being used and, and we don't even know about it. Right. I did. I read, Linda, that uh, in 2018, which, you know, the data that when you've got humans analyzing data, um, it takes a little bit longer. But the driverless car, a, a driverless car produces 30 terabytes of data in one day. 30 terabytes. Oh, my and word. That, it, it, you talk big data. I mean, it's it's colossal data. And that's both image that's both structured and unstructured data that the car is is sensing but what you know what i find fascinating is that it's going to be able to as as technology gets faster and faster and now you've got you know what we're going towards 5g or whatever on the you know on our on our internet capacity um that insurers are going to be able to use this data to be able to come up with safer ways to do things Sit, protecting the customer, protecting the passenger in the car. I did attend a FINRA conference on cybersecurity, which was terrifying in and of itself because the FBI was there and freaked me out. But one thing that the FBI um, director did say was that the, the artificial intelligence that's being built into fraud detection right now, it goes back to like the virus and the spam detection, same kind of thing, but they are able to isolate and recognize patterns much faster and be able to bring alerts on cyber threats, you know, that are going to be uh, scams and frauds and these different kinds of things that they know instantaneously when, you know, there's been a hurricane and as soon as the, the, uh, the real claims adjusters are going down there, but then there's a wave of fake emails and fake texts and things that they're, you know, they realize that, you know, he may look a little suspicious, you know, in person. And now with COVID, he can't even get there in person, but they're utilizing all of this technology. So it's fascinating the way insurance is going to be able to use this artificial intelligence moving forward. The other thing too is when you have 30 terabytes of data and you, you, you record it now, one year, two years, five years from now, technology will be able to advance. You'll be able to feed that data through and it'll be able to extract even more patterns that mm -hmm. it wasn't able to now. And, and, exactly. and I think that's, that's one of the things with the data and the, the intelligence, the technology, is once we have that data, you don't lose it. You know, a human memory can only retain so much and it's been proven that our emotions and our perceptions mm -hmm. color our memories. Where right. if you have the data, you know, in a computer or a device that isn't going to change right and i i think about when you and i were younger and i would hear on a regular basis that we're putting these records on the computer you know that 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 the the dmv or whatever it was all the paper records were getting digitized and put in and that was a manual process and so how far back the artificial intelligence can look to be able to extrapolate and going into the future, you know, that took an enormous amount of time, but now the amount of data that it has access to, you know, through the blockchain and, oh, we probably should put blockchain in for next month because now I'm more excited about <laughs> but, it. But you know, when you think about it though, this explains why, you know, when you hear about how our minds, we only use about 15 or 20% of our capacity in our brain. I mean, this is the same equivalent. Mm -hmm. You know, all that data is there in our brains and we only have a certain ability to process it. And and again, I think I think we're probably learning more about the brain by this process as well. Now we're going to talk about the Internet of Things and we've got some really interesting stuff here. OK, um, the Internet of Things consists of basically any object that connects to the Internet and that can be recognized by other devices that can send information to other devices that can receive it. OK, more and more artificial intelligence is the tool that's expanding the Internet of Things as well. And a thing can be defined in a bunch of different ways, and it is defined a lot of ways by different people. But in, in, in a real broad sense, it's basically anything that has an IP address, an Internet protocol. All right. So it could be a computer. It could be a sensor. It could be a mobile phone. It could be a network router. OK, it could be any of those things. So the purpose of the Internet of Things is for connected devices to talk to each other, okay? To talk to computer programs, to talk to applications, to exchange information. That's the whole purpose of it. Um, in the future, scientists and developers are envisioning things like smart refrigerators, where there's a camera in the refrigerator that will let you know when the milk is expired or that you only have two eggs left in the, in the carton, 
um, and smart cities where all the traffic signals are connected. So if there's an issue here, they can change the signals somewhere else. So these are the kinds of things that are being envisioned. And one of the things I want to say to you is, remember, for those of you who are older like me, remember the Jetsons, okay? When they would get on this, this walkway and the, the path moved. Well, we see them in airports all the time now. You know, you put food in the, in, the, in the machine on the counter and it cooked. Well, we have microphones. Dick Tracy had a watch he could talk into. Back then, we, we never expected to see that technology. Yeah. So just remember the stuff that we're not expecting now is going to happen in the future. And what you're looking at on your screen now is the technology that drives the Internet of Things. Wireless technology or Wi-Fi allows devices to connect using electromagnetic waves all right so it doesn't use wires doesn't use cables it uses electromagnetic waves and bluetooth is believe it or not a form of wi-fi all right but it um it it it's portable devices and it's a form of wireless technology that works within a small area usually 30 feet but you can have some really sophisticated bluetooth that'll go maybe 150 feet Artificial intelligence, we know, is the computer science that enables machines to think. So that uses the wireless technology. It connects to sensors, okay, which can detect a sound, um, a change in the environment. Um, it can sense visual, can sense motion. Think about your thermometer in your house that heats your house. You have the, you have the temperature gauge that determines the temp. And then when it gets to a certain level, it tells the heat to come on or it tells the air conditioning to come on. Okay, that's a form of artificial intelligence. We've been doing it for a long time. Then we have the RFID tags, the radio frequency identification tags. They use radio waves and we saw them first as a way to um, monitor livestock. Okay, but, but again, we're seeing it now in shipping and, um, and, and, and highway uh, toll passes. So you uh, computer subways, okay? You're seeing this technology all over the place. So basically, the sensors connect to an internet platform that collects data from a variety of sources using all these technologies. They don't, you know, it's not like they just have to use one. And the platform is going to use analytics and other methods to share information and then apply it. Like I said, with the thermometer, with the thermostat. Um, a lot of IoT platforms are able to determine what data is usable and what data isn't. And then they just do their processes and they can identify patterns, they can detect potential issues before they happen, and then they can make recommendations. So on your screen, again, are some of the things that the IoT does. Cloud computing is one of the biggest participants on the Internet of Things, and it doesn't require as many tangible resources and reduces an organization's cost. How many people like to store their data in the cloud? You know, and you can do stuff on the cloud. You have a whole bunch of different um, applications and, and, and things like that. Um, so again, we have businesses in the transportation. They, they use, they use um, the Internet of Things. What about your UPS driver? or your postman or postwoman, postal carrier, I should say. They drop mail off or they deliver a package, they enter it in a computer, it goes to um, UPS or Amazon or whoever, and then you get a text on your phone. Yeah, I've had that happen where the driver hasn't left the driveway yet and I'm already getting alerted that my package was delivered. I mean, yes. that's awesome. That really is awesome. That is. I mean, utilities are using smart grids and meters. Manufacturing, they use this technology um, for operational efficiency to control different systems, you know, security and safety. Um, you can track products and parts and raw materials. Uh, in infrastructure, we see it with lighting and power and water and cooling. So we see all this kind of stuff. We're also seeing it in healthcare. So now we're coming full circle from pet health <laughs> to human health. And it, the Internet of Medical Things ha, is amazing. We see pacemakers, we see infusion pumps, we see fetal monitors. We have patients with Parkinson's disease where a smart band that reports how much they shake. Hospital beds have sensors that can measure vital signs or when a patient moves. You know, so there's all different kinds of things. I mean, we know about the connection between the number of steps you take 
and your health and your and and your longevity. Um, I mean, even walking two hours a week at a slow pace has been known to increase someone's um, lifespan. So there's all different kinds of factors. Sleep, you know, factors show that um, if you sleep seven hours a night, those people have the longest lifespan. And if you sleep five hours a night, you have um, a 9% more, a shorter, you know, lifespan. And mm -hmm. if you sleep, actually, if you sleep, sleep more hours, uh, you know, 10 hours, it's 14% shorter. So all these different health factors affect um, human life and condition. And one thing that I, that I read was that all of this data coming in from an insurance perspective can help really hone in and personalize an insurance rating type issue. Somebody that may be considered just, you know, they would just be rated. You would just know, I'm going to be rated because of this family history or whatever. When they can actually track some of this data and monitor some of this, they can personalize those rates. They can personalize your homeowner's insurance. We're going to see this. Uh, I think now. the internet That's of medical what the things. Is. Lemonade. A lot of the insurance companies, a lot of the new insure techs, okay, are doing that now. Instead of underwriting on a pool basis, they're underwriting on an individual basis. The yes. only thing that's going to happen is people who are really high risk are going to wind up through those models not being able to get insurance. My, this is my thought. And now we have adverse selection. Possibly, but I think we've got, as long as you know the uh, Affordable Care Act doesn't get done away with, I think you've got an underlying safety net there. You know, well, for health insurance you do, but you're not going to have that safety net when it comes to auto insurance or homeowners insurance or true. business insurance. Now, the, the downside of all this wonderfulness with the technology is the fact that we have the security vulnerabilities. Data that's sent from one wearable device to another smartphone can be exposed during transfer via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. If a device is stolen, thieves can be able to access um, wearables related data. Uh, some devices have already been hacked. So mm -hmm. while it's true that some of the information that's collected can be relatively benign, some of it can be very, very private and sensitive. Um, and there's also vulnerabilities in how the data can be used. So we're gonna see laws and everything change. Uh, and one of the things to keep in mind is that some of the information connected, collected by these devices is not protected by HIPAA. So again, we're, I know the NEIC is, has a working group on that and, yeah. and they're, they're, they're hoping to change that. So again, that's one of the things that you might want to alert your clients to. It's one of the things you may want to look at um, when you're uh, helping them figure out what kind of coverage they want, what kind of policies they want, you know, what are the consequences of wearing a Fitbit and, and broadcasting. Um, right. You know. And that feeds right into the next topic on telemedicine because telemedicine, I mean, medicine, HIPAA, I mean, they, they just go together. But I know some some people, you know, Medicare and you, the 2021 booklets just hit the market. Everybody's getting yep. those. Open enrollment started today. Today. <laughs> today. So, you know, telemedicine is huge. That's a big, big feature in there that people that are seniors that are supposed to isolate themselves during this pandemic, you know, that they can get some telemedicine assistance, but yet some of them are reluctant because they're afraid of their privacy being that's right. Yeah. And, and the thing is, too, there's telemedicine and there's telehealth, which are a little different. And it's very important for us to understand the difference so we can explain it to our clients. Telemedicine is the practice of using two-way audio and video communication between patients and their doctors who are physically in different locations. All right. So uh, uh, Medicaid was doing telemedicine. Um and Medicare was using telehealth. Now, as a result of the COVID pandemic, they both have broadened and they're using both. So telemedicine is viewed as a more effective way to provide medical care. And, and, and the thing is like my grandson, he had a medical issue. He went to the doctor, he had his blood work and they did the follow-up visit using telemedicine, telehealth because the doctor is an hour and a half away. So telemedicine relates specifically to remote clinical services. It's for the provision of medical care, diagnosis, treatment, any of that stuff. Telehealth includes a broader use of technology. So it not only delivers the medical care, but it, it includes telemedicine, 
but it does things such as non-clinical services that include provider training, administrative meetings, continuing medical education. I mean, if I had a telemedicine visit with my doctor and we communicated over the internet and he said, yep, Linda, you have a little rosacea, but I wanna run this by the dermatologist I know. He would send the recording that we had and the transmission of that recording is telehealth because there's no medical stuff going on. Then when the dermatologist looks at it, okay, that's telemedicine because he's looking at this recording and he's making a diagnosis. He sends it back to my doctor. That transmission is telehealth. And then when the doctor gets on the computer and talks to me, now we're back to telemedicine. So you may not care about the distinction, but once again, the transmission and what's going on is gonna be treated differently by different privacy laws and by different policies. And there's new ICD-10 codes. Um, when doctors and healthcare providers bill uh, for medical procedures, they have to code them. And the code, the medical coding system has changed in recent years. Under the ICD-9, there was like, I don't know, 30,000. Now with ICD-10, there's like 80. And now in light of COVID, they've added codes for COVID treatment, but other non-COVID treatment that changed because of the use of telemedicine and telehealth. So again, your telemedicine is your clinical services. And typically though, you can't have a telemedicine visit until after the doctor has already seen you in person. Okay, that's usually one of the requirements. And again, Medicare and Medicaid are gonna have different requirements about how they pay. Um, but typically, uh, you know, you like I've met my my primary care physician, you've met your physicians. Um, so he would be able to do a telemedicine visit with me right now if I had a situation and 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 I couldn't go in. But telehealth is is a little different. And but I again, see, go ahead. So oh, I see cyber liability. I see, you know, that this is going to expand, um, you know, I mean, you've got the advantages and the disadvantages there. I just see, I see this expanding into the cyber liability, the professional liability, um, kind of the underwriting and the insuring of those kinds of coverages. Yep, now I've got a question. How does insurance play roles in regard to stolen data? So can you give examples? Okay, yeah, let's say that um, when my physician emailed the video of our visit to the dermatologist, if that were intercepted, if that were stolen, if somebody at the dermatologist's office left the file open on the computer and then got up and went into a different room and somebody had access to that and they had facial, they, they can use facial recognition software if they have videos of my face, if my name and my address and my date of birth and my address were attached to that video file, which it probably is, uh, they would have that information. So what we need to see is a, an a adaptation of cyber liability coverage to incorporate the use of telemedicine and telehealth. Anybody working in healthcare, their cyber policies have to be amended and updated. And, and the insurers actually have to modify the coverages right. and, and the exclusions. And the requirements, like if you like when I applied for my cyber coverage, they asked a whole bunch of questions. And if I hadn't answered appropriately, they would have declined to write coverage. And sometimes they say, all right, well, maybe you're doing this, but we want you to do that in the future. And coverage is contingent on you not only saying you'll do it, but doing it. Mm -hmm. So right. we have those. And what do you have to add to that, Pam? Because I know you do a whole lot more research than I do on the cyber subjects. Well, you know, you can you can see it in um, in auto insurance. You know, as far as you have to send in more data when they can track your driving performance and rate. You know, so that they can go back and say you will get this discount in the future if you know. I mean, I think the the lady that won't doesn't want her husband to speed when she's in labor because she doesn't yes, want the to... telematics. Yep. Yeah, the tele the telematics. That's the word I was looking for. Um, but it, when it comes to the telemedicine, I, I don't have a lot more to add to that as far as okay. security. I just know the questions that come to my mind is, <laughs> you know, is it encrypted? How is it encrypted? Is it saved? Where is it saved? How is it saved? Um, you know, we announced that we were doing a recording and we make this available, but it's just you and I. If we were 
uh, engaging the webcams of any of our participants, they would have to give us permission. And then, you know, because it's a live feed, there's just so many things that go on with this that, well, you know, and then the other thing is too is the differences in the states. For you talk about recordings in Massachusetts, right. you can't record a conversation between anyone unless all people who are participating in the conversation know it's being recorded and give permission. But other states, only one person has to know about it. So again, if you're if you're doing these telemedicine visits in the recordings, what if the doctor is in one state and the patient is in another state? I live in, in southeastern Massachusetts. The next town over is Pawtucket, Rhode Island. You know, so I don't think anything about maybe going to my doctor in the next state, mm -hmm. but there's there's now we have two state laws, plus we have federal laws. So there's a bunch of different things that that take place. Um, so that pretty much brings us to the end um, of the presentation. Do we have any questions? We've had a lot. I was hopeful. Yeah. I tried to answer them as we were going along, but if I missed any. I see that, and then I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Shaka, Shaka, um, that it's very, it's complicated or very related to the, um, it's complicating the process for the for a claim. I wouldn't know that it would be complicating. I see a lot of this technology and the Internet of Things making the claims process a lot smoother and a lot um, a lot more transparent, if you will. But I know also that from a claims perspective, it has bothered me that a garage has diagnosed my car claim, my damage, physical damage to a car because of hail without actually having an adjuster come out and look at it. It's the mechanic that took pictures and sent in. And I said, now, you may not be detecting all the damage that's, you know, you can't total a car in my estimation. I mean, if it's squished like a bug, yeah, you could total the car. But, you know, there, there are other things to me that come into play when you start talking about interjecting the artificial into what was a completely human process before. Yeah, Elizabeth just mentioned that she she attended a Zoom meeting about blockchain. That's one of the things we talk about in our emerging technology um, webinars. And yeah, that's that's a form of artificial intelligence that that it connects people through the Internet of Things. So everything these days, all the technology is pretty much tied, you know, to each other, and and we see it going on and on. Mm -hmm. I think the blockchain in the health industry is is critical because you get the yes. information for my health information is in one place and then that information is shared so that it's updated immediately, um, you know, so that somebody couldn't couldn't use my medical insurance or whatever to say that I needed to have a heart transplant or something, you know, I mean, all of that right. information. That would be great, place. right, because if it's on the blockchain, it can't be altered. And right. if but somebody it, does change it or update it, everybody sees it. Yep. Well, Linda, okay. that brings us to the end, doesn't it? That huh. does. So for those of you who want your professional development certificate, or if you have, I noticed somebody has a question for Pam, you can reach out to her at the email address on your screen. Okay. So if you want to reach out to Pam, that's how you do that. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on my website. I am the host of a couple of different podcasts, one for writers, one for taking the mystery out of insurance. So if you visit my website, you can get access to those and their related YouTube channels. The, the re-release of my um, most recent book, Taking the Mystery Out of Business, is also available on my website or Amazon. So again, um, that's how you reach out to me. Here at AD Banker, we are presenting five webinars, excuse me, yeah, webinars five days a week, three times a day, just for CE. That's just mm -hmm. our CE webinars, not our securities webinars and our pre-licensing and all kinds of other stuff. So if you check us out at adbanker.com. You can find out all about that stuff. And Good Pam, job. It's, it's yeah. been fun. We do this every month. We hope you'll join us. When is the next the next Insurance Trends webinar is the 29th, right? The 29th Four of October, today. yes. Four weeks from today. So um, maybe we'll talk about blockchain later this month and we'll come up with some other suggestions. Feel free to give us your suggestions. Like I said, we're Absolutely. happy to incorporate And fill them. out your evaluation. Oh, yes, the evaluation at the end. Once Pam ends the webinar, we want your feedback. It's really important. Yes. 
Well, you have a good afternoon, Linda, everyone. I hope you, you have a great afternoon and evening and follow it up with a, with a fantastic weekend. And stay safe out there. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care and be well.